I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and it's time for some ASAP Frontline. Today, another one of our discussions from um, SEC ASAP in Destin, Florida. And um, this one is on uh, my opioid update. I've I've done this about uh, every year, uh, multiple around the southeast, um, actually around the country. But opioids, the evolution, being from Kentucky, it's been a big a huge issue and um, so we've given an update every year and this was no different in 2018 some of the numbers have been updated since this talk was given but still the themes still ring true so um, SEC ASAP opioid update 2018 from Destin Florida so every year I try to update on where we are with opioids I mentioned last year It was the first year that I saw a little bit of light on the horizon um, in terms of where we're going. It seemed like before that, especially on the political stage, it was just, you know, just kind of like that thing you see on the news, just randomly shooting your gun up in the air and hoping you hit something. I feel like we've got a lot more targeted. Everybody's kind of jumping in, all uh, all hands on deck now from uh, multiple areas of the uh, communities um, to address this. So I think we're actually getting some improvement in some areas, but uh, there's still significant things uh, that need to happen. All right, so we want to talk about some of the legislation around the country, um, look at some of the liability that, that's potentially coming around from it, and then um, some of the things that are, I say here in Lexington, because I actually wrote this initially for Tennessee ASAP, this version of it, uh, but actually I've added some more stuff even since then. Um, some of the things that are happening around the country and things that we're doing. So here's the most recent update. I'll try to get this graph every year. CDC releases it every year. Um, 116 people every single day are dying from an opioid-related overdose, um, whether by itself or in combination, usually combination. Um, 11.5 million people are misusing. Two million are, are still addicted to that. So you can still see the numbers there. The big one to look at on the bottom right 500 billion dollars annually impact the United States. There's actually some estimates that it could be getting close to a trillion dollars a year of impact across the board with opioids. So it's not just pills, it's not just overdoses. There's a ton that's gonna impact every single one of us out there. The amount of opioids prescribed, um, 2015 compared to 1999, uh, 180 milligrams morphine equivalent in 1999, 640 um, milligrams morphine equivalent in 2015. I actually had a case that we recently reviewed in Kentucky where we calculated out that the person was providing um, the equivalent of 20 pills of Lortab per person on every single visit to the clinic, and it wasn't a pain clinic. It's, it was family practice. So, you know, it's huge numbers out there. If you look here, where did we peak? We actually peaked in 2012 with prescribing rate per 100 persons, 81.3 prescriptions per 100 persons. So this country, we almost got to one, one to one, not quite, basically four to five. Um, and now in 2016, a couple years ago, we got gotten down to 66.5, but unfortunately, that's because at that point, a lot of folks have transitioned out of pills as well. So the peak right there. Roughly 21 to 29% of patients prescribed opioids for chronic pain will misuse them. Um, there was an article that actually came out the day before yesterday. That was 18 hours ago. So it's yesterday. 18 hours ago, talking about a review study for chronic pain that found that Uh, With the prescription of opioids, 21% uh, reported a 50% decrease in their pain score. So 21% reported that they at least halved their pain. In that same study, they compared if you put the person on Tylenol and ibuprofen, that drop is 62%. So that's kind of where we're getting with these things is we've got better things out there. Even yesterday when we were talking, um, there was questions and comments about the perception that opioids are stronger and thus better. In my practice, we still get that. I still get the um, kidney stone pain, the person that comes in, and our physician says, oh, that is really painful, and it is. It is really painful. So I'm gonna give them two milligrams of Dilaudid. But the research over and over and over is telling us 
that we have better things that get better reported results and management of pain. There is a role. There is a role. But it's not the role that many of us have been using it for. Between 8 to 12 percent develop an opioid use disorder. A comment I had in Tennessee when I was there was, and this is a well-respected leader in emergency medicine, that two to three days, not a big deal. You're not going to get that. We're worried about these long-time prescribers. Thus, emergency physicians are not the problem. We need to work on everybody else. And true, we only make up about 4% of the prescribed uh, opioids in, in the, uh, uh, around the country. We were 7%, we're down to 4%, so we made improvements. Primary care is up to about 81%, 82%. So we're making progress, but I'm going to show you in a minute why saying that a short course is zero risk. Just like the talk we just had. So it's low, but there's still risk when you have... When you, when you put anybody on any type of medication like that that can do bad things potentially. An estimated 4 to 6 percent who misuse prescription opioids will eventually end up on heroin and flipping that around 80 percent of people who are on heroin first started on prescribed opioids. What's the basis for that last number? Because that's completely wrong in my experience. It's reported. It's reported. It's always been 70 80 percent. That I started on Norco? I mean where that number is critical. It's reported. It's, re it's reported from the addicts, and everybody I've talked to, especially in Kentucky, that's what they report. It may be wrong, at least in your experience, but it's not wrong across the country. And it depends on where you are. I mean, the issue is there is a trail. You don't start when you first have your first drink and have two liters. You start somewhere and with the escalated dosing. And most people don't just pick up heroin, most. And there's a six-time variability by county. So here it is. Here's what I was talking about. There's your 13.3-day course was the average day prescription prescribed in 2006. That has a one-year uh, probability of continued use, not necessarily dependence or addiction, but continued use of nearly 25%. Where we peaked in 2015 with the length of the prescription, 17.7 is over a 30% chance of continued use. You will look at the three-year use down there, but look at the day course down below that. That never really goes to zero. That friend that I've talked about before, uh, growing up, it was her first prescription, that first pill, because that pathway was already there. So we talked about this graph. It's one of my favorite graphs. CDC hasn't really updated it. You see it kind of ends in 07, 08, but we've been updating it. And this shows where people say, we've been here before, we've done this before, but now it's, it's just the same thing, so why do we need to worry about it? Remember heroin back in the early or mid-70s, cocaine uh, mid to late 80s, early 90s. Then we start to see that upswing associated with the opioids. But right now, where we are with this graph is right here. So Kentucky is, so you mentioned, you see down there, we're down about 2.5 to 2.9. The highest uh, West Virginia ever was was 4.1 in 1999 before the opioid epidemic, and that's when we started the upswing. West Virginia is currently 52 per 100,000. That means one in 2,000 people in the state of West Virginia will die this year because of opioids, an opioid overdose. That would mean if we translate Lexington, where I'm from, that would be somewhere between around 150 to 200 deaths this year from opioid overdoses. So it's a huge issue. It's the the magnitude of which we've never seen before. I mean, the numbers are huge, and that is by far the highest. Kentucky's third, is tied for third, at 32.5. Interesting, West Virginia, if you saw the graph last year, West Virginia has gone up another about eight. They were 44, now 52. So the numbers are huge. So it says, emergency department, I mentioned this uh, study earlier. Emergency department's not a major source of opioid prescriptions. The average course in an emergency department is that two to three, four days. That's where a lot of the laws are coming from within our states. Kentucky just put one in that says a three-day limit. Of course, it's got an out. Basically, your out is anything you want. You need to do more, you can do more. You just have to document it in your chart. So doctor's offices, primary care, physicians, whatever it may be, 71, went from 71% to 83%. During the 17-year analysis, and emergency departments went from 7% down to 4%. So we're addressing it, but that's probably because we're seeing a lot of those back-end effects. 
I think a lot of us are jaded just because of what we see, the number of people we've dragged out of cars and um, addressed, especially those of us in EMS and what we've seen from that standpoint. We're getting a call yesterday that um, a lot of the, uh, some of the Narcan batches have been recalled uh, because they're finding little pieces of the rubber stopper inside them. So I was getting calls from news folks saying, hey, what does this mean for uh, opioid overdoses? I said, well, let's check and see what our numbers are. But we don't have much to worry about because we have two different versions of it. So um, something to think about if you're in the EMS world right now. There is a recall. Legislation. We have the drug monitoring programs. 37 states as of January of 2018 have mandatory monitoring in some way, shape, form, and fashion. I have to evaluate my CASPER report, which is our version in Kentucky, before I do any prescription. I can give doses in the ER, we can give doses in the hospital, but theoretically I cannot discharge anybody with any type of uh, prescription without reviewing that CASPER program. Now when we first started, we were talking about a week or two weeks potentially that uh, a, a prescription before it would show up on that program. Now theoretically it's 48 hours, but I'm not as much worried about that prescription from two weeks ago. I want to see, I mean other than patterns, I do want to see patterns and, and potential risk, but I also want to see what that may be overlapping. That's the risk is if you have three or four providers and you've got multiple prescriptions at the same time, those working together in a negative fashion. And in our state, if you are, if a person overdoses, during the time frame of your prescription, your license is automatically reviewed. And there's the potential that you can be prosecuted for it, theoretically. I don't think it's really going to happen, but I think it could in the right situation. Pain clinic regulations, educations for the patients and providers, that's physicians, uh, PAs, nurse practitioners. I uh, find a lot of it is focused on the physician side of things. Examination and monitoring requirements and uh, prescription duration limits. I mentioned that 24 states of uh, December 2017 have some sort of prescribing limitation on board. So make sure you know that. A lot of our folks do not realize that's in place. And so you're sitting there, all of a sudden get a pre prescription in front of my face from a PA or nurse practitioner, and it's uh, for whatever it may be. And it's like, hey, this, doesn't, this calculates out to five days. So we need to cut that back. We need to stay within the law, or we need to document why. Explain to me why we need to do this. Legislation, restrictions on refills, long-term acting, naloxone, um, it's becoming more available. How many states have naloxone available at your pharmacies without prescription? We do. If a pharmacy qualifies, they can get training and can, and can get, you can give out naloxone without a physician prescription. Most of them are allowed to do that. The issue is what we're finding. They just reached out to me yesterday, uh, excuse me, last week, and the state did, and said, hey, listen, we have this opportunity. We've provided all of this free naloxone, but nobody is willing to write it. Is it because we're afraid to write it? Is it because we're against writing it? Is it because we don't know we can write it? I mean, the question is, at what point somebody comes in with this risk factor and we don't give the potential bridge rescue drug for that uh, potential uh, behavior, and we have the potential that they could actually have something, a bad outcome. Can that come back on us for not prescribing that. And I think that potentially could come down the road. And so we're looking at ways we can get uh, physicians uh, and other providers more active in, in making this, uh, making naloxone available. There was 1,300 bills between 2015 and 2017. The issue is, during that time frame, a lot of those bills are from folks not within healthcare. They're people trying to, um, to advance their political capital. They're folks that are trying to make it the next stage. And so they're not the best for the physicians, the other health care providers, or the patients in mind. They are just reactions instead of actually uh, some form of actually thought out, evidence proven, or evidence suggestive solution. And of course the marijuana debate. That's a lot of things I see is, is when I talk about this is, well, if we legalize marijuana, that it would fix the whole thing. And there's some research out there that shows marijuana's role in pain management. But I think we have to keep them separated. I mean, in Kentucky, the whole, perp the whole argument for legalizing marijuana is to get tax money. Well, let's actually think through things and look at the research and find out what's beneficial, how it's beneficial, when it's beneficial, and how to administer it before we start going, gang it, going all in and saying, hey, this is a great way to build bridges throughout our state. We do have terrible bridges. HHS, public health emergency in 2017. And everybody recalls that 
that one word, an emergency, makes a big difference in what it could have been. And if they change that one word, it means a lot more funding potential. So changing that one word in federal uh, nomenclature changes what, what funds and actions are available. But their goal is to improve access to treatment and recovery services. I think that's key. We've talked about that every single time we've been here, is that we have to get treatment and recovery. Promoting the use of naloxone, making it more available. We have it available for our police. We have it available in EMS fire. And we also have it available to our patients, families, bystanders, if they like it. Our health department has courses available. It requires nothing. You just have to show up take the course on administration and they give you naloxone with the instructions how to use it. So any of us can go do that at our health department in Lexington. Strengthening understanding of the epidemic through better public health surveillance, providing support for research on pain and addiction, so better ways to manage, and then advancing better practices from pain management as I mentioned. So let's talk about progress. This is what you want to see. We want to see progress. The so St. Joseph Health System, their Alto program, Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. LaPietra, um, I've talked to them several times before. I love keeping up with what they are doing up there. They have an 82% opioid reduction in the emergency department and prescriptions within the first year. And they've maintained that 82% reduction. Now, the good thing about that, and everybody says, well, what about the patients? What about the pain? Better pain management, decreased complaints from the patients, Shorter length of stays in the emergency department, decreased admissions to the hospital. Every metric that we want to meet for us and for our patients are improved with the program. And it's not because we're just taking away something, it's because we're putting actually in what has evidence basis to it, the pain management that it has evidence with it, as opposed to what we've done which has just taken a medicine that has a narrow spectrum of benefit in certain cases and used it on everything that has the word pain involved with it. Colorado ASAP, 36% reduction during the six-month pilot in 2017. That was a 10-hospital pilot program. They're rolling that out to the entire state now. Um, again, higher patient satisfaction, improved pain scores, 35,000 fewer opioids in six months. That is impactful. That decreases that one arm that we have to decrease, and that's the new addict that we've talked about. We've got two arms. We have how do we prevent further addiction while still managing pain, and we have how do we manage those that are already dependent and addicted? How do we best assist them? We're actually talking about there's two forms of legislation right now that are on in, uh, in the federal legislature. If you were involved with Leadership and Advocacy Conference, you know about them. Uh, the Alto Act, which would take that program and apply it potentially across the country, and the POWER Act, which makes more easily available medication-assisted treatment from the emergency department. There is some research that shows medication-assisted treatment initiated in the emergency department increases recovery, uh, potential successful recovery. So how can we start treatment, warm hand off to another treatment program, and get that person clean when they're ready? The monitoring programs, significant regulation of pain clinics, and then access to recovery resources, again, is one of my big things. We have to have recovery. All I, what we have is we have naloxone, we have needle exchange programs, we have some sites that have the monitored injection uh, sites. All those are, those are a bridge. But what we've had in the past is a bridge to nowhere. We have to have a bridge that arrives at some place where we can get them recovered. Our whole goal is to, to save them, to keep them alive and then give them the tools when they're ready to actually recover, successfully recover from addiction. Which if anybody in here has had addiction before, you can testify to the challenges of overcoming that, in, in, that internal wiring that says this is a necessity to my day. So we have to figure out places that we can get people to help them in the long run. Liability. Recently, federal liability, statement of interest. We are very interested in this topic. Is this going to be the next tobacco? I think we're seeing it. I think we're seeing that everybody is piling on now and saying, you, Purdue Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Kentucky, it's McKesson. McKesson, they were uh, one of the suppliers or distributors of medications and of opioid medications. There's over 100 lawsuits on the books right now to these. So McKesson, Floyd County, which is a small county in Kentucky, very small county, they supplied between 2010-2016 477 pills per person 
individual physicians that are being called on this, that are being charged with crimes associated with. So we've seen this, uh, that one right there, Dr. Singh, uh, February 2016, 30 years for second degree murder. You know, there's the potential for civil liability, criminal liability, professional sanctions associated with this. Everybody's coming down right now on who to blame, but that still doesn't establish how to fix the problem and the folks that we have that are addicted at this time. For dealers, increased penalties. Most places are decreasing the crimes um, and punishment on the uh, addict, on the user, but they're increasing the crimes and jail time and punishments for the dealers and suppliers of the illegal aspects of drugs. So let's talk about Purdue drug makers. They've been hit with that lawsuit, $634 million. Um, that sounds like a lot of money. To me, that's a ton of money. I would do all right with that. I'd probably have one of these boats out here. Maybe two. But that, to them, they were making billions in profits every year associated with this drug. So that's nothing for what they do. But that's because they misbranded, calling it non-addictive. So they got nailed for calling it non-addictive when the evidence showed just the contrary. But then during that time, they actually worked to weaken the laws for their executives to be responsible. They went through and through all their lobbyists made rules and laws that protected their executives from this misbranding and from um, what they were doing to our patients. Negotiating federal settlement for all lawsuits, uh, that's what they tried to do. Purdue tried to negotiate and say, hey, listen, let's settle everything, and then from now on you just say we're clean from this. And so they dumped $2.3 million to the lawmakers to try to get those decisions in your favor. You know, I've always told um, when I was president of KSEP back a number of years ago, we can't say we're buying legislation. That's crap. You absolutely are buying legislation. That's what they were trying to do, $2.3 million to buy legislation in their, in their favor. You go up to your legislators, and if there's not money involved, they're not listening really hard. And that's the unfortunate thing about modern politics. Money drives policy. So Purdue stopped, I don't know if everybody noticed in February, Purdue let go all of their sales force for OxyContin and let go of all the marketing and say, we're done with this. It's not because they've all of a sudden had a change of heart, because they've had a change in pockets and change in wallets. The family that owns Purdue is one of the richest families in the world. Arthur Sackler. Arthur Sackler. So Dreamland, you haven't read it. You're behind the times. You've got to read it. So Arthur Sackler, he um, was a marketing magnate who did a bunch of ads and that sort of things. He got, decided to get in the drug, bought Purdue Pharmaceuticals, created the first billion dollar drug, which was Valium, and then 1996 when they put all this together to make Oxy OxyContin. So yes, um, and yes, he still is one of the richest people uh, in the country, if not world. Let's talk about what we're doing here in Lexington, but this is something that I'm seeing across the country, not just Lexington. I like that because I live there. It's pretty cool. But um, it has to do with other areas of the country as well. It's when everybody starts to get on board. So laws and regulations. Theoretically, there was going to put together a tax on, to, on opioid prescriptions. I can mark that out now. It came up, but come to find out there's a lot of laws and rules that says you can't tax something special. If you do, then you can't get federal funds. It's all weird. It's all kind of fuzzy math. But um, Opioid disposal programs. That was always a big issue. There was no place to drop off opioids. You could drop off your z pack that you didn't need, but you don't, get, you don't turn those in. You save those for later. Everybody saves those for later. So what are you really going to turn in? So everybody, we got all these folks that have the opioids. We found in my particular hospital, our gallbladder surgeries were getting 30 to 45 tablets. The average use was somewhere between 8 to 12 of those tablets, so everything else was sitting back on the shelf, but nowhere to go because you can't take opioids and controlled substances to typical drop-off locations. And everybody's environmental now. We don't want to flush them down the toilet. I mean, how are we finding now that our, our, our muscles have opioids in them? So what are we going to do with them? Well, now we have disposal locations. Many of them are at, um, are at police precincts and other places like that. Um, they're actually safe, so if you bring them, even if it's an illicit drug, and drop it off there, most of them have, some, have immunity. That if you drop that off and are turning it in, even if it's illicit, that you will not be prosecuted for that. Narcan, EMS, fire, police, public. That's one thing to think about. If you come up on a scene, all of a sudden, boom! Somebody wakes up and somebody's given Narcan. What do we do next? That's a challenge we're facing in the EMS world. If somebody's been revived with Narcan, they're now alert and oriented. They're refusing to come in. We haven't even had really contact with them yet because they got it from local. What, what, even if they, what if they get it and they don't call? Hey, they're awake now, so we're not going to call EMS. 
There's a lot of things we're working through with this Narcan thing, uh, challenges that we're seeing. We had this interfaith presentations here. Um, we brought in our churches. We brought in our inner city churches because they've been dealing with a lot of these issues with heroin and cocaine for decades. And it was swept under the rug, but they're an invaluable resource. Folks that can help on how do we deal with folks that are doing this? How can we figure out how to have recovery resources? That person that can be there available when you call that says, yes, I'll be there. I'll come in. I'll listen to you. I'll get you home. I'll get you safely where you need to be. I will take you to recovery if you want to go there. And so what we did is we got in there and we got all of these churches together. And we said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, that's it. We have to figure out what we can do from a community basis. Each one is, each area is different. Lexington is different from Richmond, Kentucky, and Georgetown, Kentucky, and Winchester. And so what can we do? And one raises his hand. He says, man, I was wondering where we were going to go with this, but I have five houses that we've just been sitting on. We, had, we didn't know what we were going to do with them. Um, they need to be fixed up, but we don't know what to do with that. And another church, they raise their hands and say, hey, we don't have houses, but we have people in our church that can fix up houses. And then another church raises their hands and says, you know what? We can staff the houses. And we can be there, and we're willing to be the ones you call in the middle of the night. And so those programs coming together, when you get people brainstorming on solutions, we can do things that are not just dollar-generated from state and federal government. There are community coming together, people of interest who want to help other folks. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be religious-based. It can be whatever you want. It can be whatever groups you want to pool together. On ours, it just happens to be that because we're in, a, we're in the South, and we've got churches everywhere. So it makes it easy, pull everybody together. University of Kentucky, that's Dr. Philip Chang. We are in a meeting last week with him with the Kentucky Hospital Association on potentially getting Alto in throughout all the emergency departments across the state. So they've decided to have an education and decrease prescribing. That's important because I think many of you may remember me talking about the fact when I was uh, on my surgery rotations in emergency medicine as an intern, um, we had the pre-printed prescriptions for the 120, 240, 500 and something uh, opioids, and that's what you got. We, they signed about 20 every morning, and you just handed them out as, congratulations, we're getting you out of here. Here's your, here's your bag of snacks, crackers, water, and prescription for opioids. Have a good day. Sorry things happen to you in a bad way. But we gave it to every single patient, and they took ownership of that now and said, here, we've got to change this. We've got to change the way um, we're prescribing for trauma, that we're writing for trauma, and the way we treat pain for trauma. So a lot of multidisciplinary, so ultrasound-guided uh, nerve blocks or regional blocks, um, non-narcotic pain management, things such as uh, more active use of physical therapy and other methods like that. So there, he's very active in getting that done. And with Baptist Health System, which is a system I'm with right now, we finally we're going to try to redo our entire opioid management system for the entire system, from everything from primary care to inpatient to hospice, everywhere in between. And that's what we have to get. We have to get that full ownership of everybody jumping in and saying, we need to fix this at every single level. You know, I may not be able to change the world, but I can change somebody's world and I can impact the world that I'm working in. So how can we make that happen? Here's two resources that are pretty fantastic. And your state should get these as well. Something similar. So what is one of the biggest challenges when somebody reaches that point, they say, I want recovery, is knowing where to go. And you go to one place and they say, sorry, we don't take your insurance, or sorry, we don't have a bed available, or sorry, we can't do this. And what happens? You lose that momentum for recovery. We lose that moment that we have to, to save that person. So it's organized now. Get helplex.org and find helpnowky.org. You put in your demographics, you put in your location, you put in every, things about you, and it shows you which programs are available. What do you qualify for? So you can have a targeted recovery plan. There's lots of things, there's some things available for the very low income. If you've got all the resources in the world, you can go anywhere you want. It's that middle, that middle ground that doesn't have the best insurance, that doesn't have um, a, lot, a huge bank account to cover recovery, that they're the ones that are going to get left behind because there's not a whole bunch for them. So being able to put these all together in a way that we can find them and get them targeted to where they go and facilitate that warm handoff that says, here you go. I'm glad you're at this point now. Let's get you better. Let's help you recover and get through this. So what do we do? Moving forward, again, you got to engage the entire community. This isn't just a health care, and it's not just a law enforcement challenge. This is the entire community. We have to get everybody involved. 
We have to streamline access to those recovery resources. What is the role of emergency medicine? Is it initiating medication-assisted treatment? Is it what I like to call uh, emergency medicine is very much the air traffic control of medicine? We get you when and where you need to be. Whether it's inpatient, outpatient, somewhere in between, that's one of our major jobs. So can we get social work? Can we get other resources available? Can we get community resources in our departments to help folks get to where they need to be? Continue to work on these ALTO programs. Rethinking pain management, going with the evidence, not just what we've been told from the, the drug industry, not what we've learned over two decades of medicine. Let's go with the evidence. Let's go with, with shows that Tylenol or acetaminophen and naproxen or ibuprofen in many cases are superior. And what about physical therapy? What about uh, topical managements? What can we do that are actually better for that patient and have decreased risks? Treat based on the best, safest options. And there's not one prescription that's going to fix this. There's not one thing that's going to fix this. As you know, and like with the drug shortages, you target one thing, there's 11 other things that are, going to, that are going to cause issues. So we have to get it from different angles. That's why it's going to take so many people. Medicine, law enforcement, pain management, recovery resource, politics, community. How do you get out of the worst epidemic in U.S. history, worst drug epidemic in U.S. history? It's all hands on deck. It's going to be everybody's job to do this. And what, what can we do? You know, what things that the opioid epidemic has done for me has changed a lot of the way I see people. When I started all of this, I would have been completely against needle exchange. I would have been completely against medication-assisted treatment from the emergency department. I would have definitely been against monitored injection sites. I would have been against Narcan on the street in the hands of abusers. But then when you see people sitting in front of you and you talk to them about their story, how they got to where they did, how they do this, they don't want to be there. People don't want to be addicted. They don't want to be on prescription opioids. They don't want to be on heroin. It's either them being told they need to be on it, their brain wired to say they need it, or hopelessness that they don't have another option. So when you sit there in front of somebody and you start to think about it, the fact that it could be anyone that I know, it could be myself, it could be one of my children one day, it could be my friends, it could be my relatives, but it could be a complete stranger, but it's a person. And at some point, they were in the same place as we were, thinking about what they wanted to do with the future. And they didn't think, I want to be an addict with the potential of dying any given day, sitting there when I'm 35 years old. They had dreams too. They had things they wanted to do. And so when I hear people now say, just let them die, let Darwin sort it out, that's saying that somebody's life isn't worth it. That's saying that that person is worth less than somebody else. And that's not, as a physician, what I feel like we should be about. We should fight like hell for every single person that comes into our departments. Sure, you're going to have frustrations. Sure, you're going to may say a bad word here and again. Sure, you're going to say, I just can't deal with that right now. But it, just if you walk into a room and think that's another person who started off at almost maybe a different situation, but started off with dreams and hopes and goals for their life. And what can I do to help them? What can I do to get them to the next stage and help them get to a dream that involves not being in that emergency department, not being recovered with Narcan, and not being addicted to opioids? So what can we do to, to impact that? My wife always calls it filling buckets. You don't want to be somebody who takes water out of somebody's bucket. You don't want to empty somebody's bucket. You want to add something positive to somebody's life today. So with that in mind, I'm hoping next year we can come back and talk about wonderful things that have perfused throughout the country even further um, that are now helping people in some of the steps that we're taking and, um, and continued um, advancement on uh, getting a handhold on this epidemic. You've been listening to the SEC ASAP Opioid Update uh, by yours truly from um, down in Destin in June of 2018. I invite your comments, suggestions. Feel free to email me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, as well as liking our Facebook page, uh, ASAP Frontline, and at Everyday Med on Twitter. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.